Hello everyone, welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today I want to talk to you about uh, this topic of digital audio filtering, which is a deep topic indeed. We're going to start by just talking about filtering in general and what it is and why you do it. And that should get us through this first of four lectures on this topic. Hope everyone's safe and well out there. So let's dive into this and see what it looks like. So what's a filter? We talk about filters a lot in audio. We talked last time about the frequency domain and about Fourier transforms and that sort of thing. A filter is a thing that changes the amplitude or phase of some of the frequencies of a sound. So the idea of a filter is to change the shape of the sound specifically in the frequency domain in interesting ways. There's a ton of filters floating around. Uh, the most obvious is that an awful lot of equipment in the audio world has a tone control. And a tone control might come in the one knob type where you turn the tone from more bass to more treble or it might come in a two or three band equalizer type where you turn up the bass or turn up the treble or turn up the mid-range. Might even be a full-on graphic equalizer with 14 bands, but in any case, the idea there is that we decide what frequencies we want to emphasize and what frequencies we want to de-emphasize. Typically, that's done either to flatten out an uneven frequency response from a microphone, from a speaker, from an amplifier system, from a room, or just because it sounds better that way. And there's a lot in audio of it sounds better that way. Another effect that is around a lot is the, or, you know, is just plain old effects. Uh, there's a million effects and we'll look at some of them in more detail later in the course. One good example, I think, is the wah. The wah is an absolutely classic electric guitar sound. Uh, and sounds kind of like that. There's the unwad. And there's the wad version of the same sound. So um, that's, um, you know, classic frequency manipulation. That wah is just literally using a foot pedal that you couldn't see off the bottom on the video to uh, actually change the frequency band that's being band passed by a low pass, being low passed by a low pass filter. Uh, band limiting is really common. Anti-aliasing filters that keep a signal's frequencies, try to keep a signal's frequencies below those that are above the Nyquist limit so that you can sample the frequency legitimately. Uh, resampling filters that allow you again to play with the Nyquist limits so that you can adjust the rate at which you're sampling with existing samples and so much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's sort of a notion of ideal filters floating around. The idea is that there are filter shapes that might be highly desirable to have for doing audio stuff. The obvious choices are to have some sort of pass band in which in those frequencies are passed untouched, some kind of stop band where the frequencies are eliminated altogether. And that would be a very classic kind of filter to want. Here's an example of sort of a low pass filter idea you can see there's sort of a stop band um, for the low pass uh, where it passes the frequencies below some target frequency and stops everything else. Here's the high pass where it stops everything below some frequency and then passes the rest. Band pass uh, and where you know, want to pass some range in the middle and then band stop or band notch over here where you want to do the opposite you want to cut out a band in the middle and with those four kinds of filters 
you can do a lot of things, especially by mixing outputs of filters and adjusting amplitudes. So yeah, this business with units and the amplitude of things rears its ugly head again. It's really common to do DSP of this kind, ignoring this sort of sampling rate and ignoring the absolute gain. Um, in the time domain, we just number the samples. In the frequency domain, we range from zero to one or zero to pi sometimes. Uh, and that's a dimensionless number. It doesn't depend on the sampling rate at all. And the amplitude is typically normalized to minus one to one in the time domain and zero to one in the frequency domain. And these are real common conventions that you'll see through the literature. And what they do is they eliminate having to say everything for particular choices of sampling rate, particular choices of amplitude, etc. And you know, decibels continue to be a thing that's floating around. There's a lot of decibel scales floating around. The most common one that didn't get formatted very well here is 20 to the log base 10 of 20 times the log base 10 of some amplitude and the amplitude may be an rms amplitude it may be a peak amplitude it may be a peak to peak amplitude but that number the sort of take the amplitude take the log base 10 and multiply by 20 is what we normally mean by decibels and often it's decibels relative to some reference but sometimes it's just you know absolute decibels in some reference but it's sometimes just relative We can talk about what it means to estimate the quality of a filter. Uh, filter quality is kind of a nebulous concept. The ideal low pass, it's a brick wall, um, quote unquote. It's got exactly one in the pass band, zero in the stop band, and the transition at the corner frequency, like in that diagram we saw, is instantaneous. We go instantaneously from on to off. Well, that's not really a thing. And so we're going to um, sort of see that we will have to take some compromises. And there's something called the Q factor, which Wikipedia talks a lot about, which is sort of a measure of the quality of a filter in terms of the abruptness and lack of ringing at its transition point. Um, like most of the sound stuff we've talked about, before there were any computers, we did a lot of this with analog, and we still do build analog filters. It's a really common to, thing to do. Take some electricity and some resistors, capacitors, inductors, op amps, all these fancy hardwares, wire them together with wire. And all the things we said earlier about analog electronics sort of apply here. Uh, you have to keep these filters simple because you want to keep the component counts down and make them draw reasonable power and so forth and so forth. And they aren't typically great filters. They're hard to design to work well with so few simple components, but there are times when you just can't get by without them. Obvious examples, uh, an anti-aliasing filter. If you're going to apply to a if you're going to pass a signal, an electrical signal representing a sound into an analog to digital converter, well, then you're going to have to sample the sample rate at the analog to digital converter to be as high, you know, be high enough to capture, to be twice the fr highest frequency present in the sound coming in. Well, how do I know what the highest frequency is present in the sound coming in? It could be anything depending on the equipment I'm feeding it. Well, the answer is that we do what's called an anti-aliasing filter, which blocks all the frequencies above half the sampling rate. And you'd like that to be a brick wall filter. You'd like the transition to be as sharp as possible. In practice, you are gonna have the filter sort of rolling off between one and, from one to zero across a few kilohertz, which is one of the reasons why people in audio like the 44100 standard is because if you sample at 48K, a 44100 signal, then you can NIL, sorry, if you sample at 44100, then you can sort of have filters that have a little bit of extra slop and um, let the thing roll off a little higher. 
another thing is DC blocking capacitors, which is where if I'm feeding the signal in and it's not perfectly around zero volts, then I'm going to have a problem because the analog to digital converter only has so much range and I'll be, you know, clipping off the top or clipping off the bottom. And to fix that, we put a little filter in the front that tries to just block DC frequencies so the signal settles down into 50% above, 50% below, so the signal centers out. Um, the digital filters we're going to look at are something called linear time invariant systems. This is a thing, or at least some of them are, most of them are. Uh, what that means is that, first of all, the output signal is always a linear function of the input signal. There's no distortion, so we don't get harmonics generated by our filter. We really want our filter to maybe change frequencies, but we don't want it to create new frequencies out of the old ones, and so linearity is super important. And the output signal is some function of the input time, does not depend on the input time, is a little harsh, but it says that if I sh put the signal in a second later, I'll get the same output, but a second later, right? So it says that you shouldn't have some kind of state or memory in the filter that remembers the past in some sense. And that way um, you can sort of predict always that the filter is a pure function, albeit a delayed pure function, from the input signal to the output signal. Most analog filters are linear time invariant. Um, so yeah, that's that idea. So that's some of the very, very basics of how filtering works. In the next lecture, we'll dive into some of the more details of digital filtering and how to actually start to achieve that. So I hope everyone's doing well out there again. I will talk to you soon.